you're exceptionally well behaved. <laughs> the speed with which you <laughs> took your seat, thank you. You caught me by surprise. Um, I I'm, would like, on behalf of my colleagues at the Daniel, uh, at the Danube Institute, to welcome you to this event. It's taking place on a holiday, and um, obviously, I think that has limited uh, some of the attendees, but some of the attendants. But let me say that, in addition to the distinguished audience we have here, um, we will have a larger one online as well, which is important because the topic is important and the speakers uh, are well versed in addressing it and similar topics. Um, I will begin by saying, however, um, we have two other events uh, this week, um, on Wednesday and on Friday. On Wednesday, we have a lecture on parental rights in education, something which is a matter of contestation everywhere. And uh, I think Antonio here, who's delivering it, is in the audience. Yes, he is. Uh, uh, Anthony, could you just stand and identify yourself? Uh, Antonio here is, is, is our, a distinguished fellow who's joining us here for the next uh, two weeks, um, addressing particularly parental rights in education, but also cultural policy in Britain and Hungary. So, um, uh, welcome. Um, we also, I think in the audience, uh, I can't quite see it. Uh, no, well, I don't, we have in, in the audience too, uh, or rather <laughs> outside, he's attending the debate, but I don't see him here. Um, the uh, uh, Carlos Royer, uh, who is here for a year as a distinguished fellow, and who, uh, oh, I see, I didn't see you. <laughs> you yeah, uh, welcome here. Um, Carlos is um, uh, has a distinguished uh, career in. Uh, I'm bound to say, very impressive uh, position. Um, namely uh, Editor-in-Chief of the National Interest in Washington. I say that because I was once myself Editor-in-Chief of the National Interest in Washington. <laughs> and uh, so welcome and we look forward to um, what you had to say as well. Um, now that brings me to the um, uh, two speakers uh, and I'm, I'm going to be a third. Um, it, it, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for me uh, to introduce Simon Kennedy. Uh, Simon is uh, a distinguished academic at the, uh, the University of Queensland and is now uh, occupies, wears two hats really. He is the managing editor of the magazine Quadrant uh, in Australia, which is the single most distinguished magazine in Australia and certainly the leading, uh, um, the leading magazine uh, of the, of the uh, right in the country. Um, Again, I had been an editor of Quadrant, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's well. It's nice to welcome a colleague, um, and and um, and I and I still contribute to it. Um, before I actually ask um, the speaker to take uh, uh, the, the the four I mentioned, our fourth fellow, uh, namely um, Jeremy Carl. Um, Jeremy, would you like to take a bow? Uh, <laughs> Jeremy is the um, uh, Jeremy is coming back as a distinguished fellow for the second time. Uh, he overlaps on topic somewhat with Anthony over here because uh, Hungarian cultural policy and cultural policy in other countries is one of his major topics. Um, and um, we are delighted to welcome him back and look forward. Um, he will himself be uh, speaking later in the week. Um, the, the topic um, is, is an important one, but one that is, I would say, not well known. It's a very important one. Um, not well known in um, uh, Hungarian politics. And it is a proposed amendment to the Australian constitution known as The Voice. It was, uh, as the invitation uh, hints, uh, it bears some, the argument over it bears some uh, resemblance to the, uh, the Brexit vote, vote in Britain. And it has had a similar result in that it was the result in which the um, voters surprised the establishment, which had expected initially a clear um, acceptance of the voice and set steadily saw 
uh, its margin of victory eroded until it became a very substantial, almost two to one defeat. Now, when you have almost all of the institutions of the country on one side of the argument and the voters choose the second, that is not only interesting for the topics about which the vo voice dealt with, and that's obviously one of the topics that Simon's going to be dealing with, uh, but it also tells you somehow or other, but politics elsewhere has gone awry insofar as the, the voters have taken such a different position to the, the views of their betters um, who were really expecting and also determined upon a yes vote. And instead, they got a no one. So I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, our speaker to uh, open the debate with uh, his remarks. He is the principal speaker. Afterwards, Jeremy Carl will respond, um, and I will then add my own uh, interpretation. But thank you very much indeed. And Simon, uh, welcome again. And uh, this, is, this, this is the second time this year you're speaking here. It is. Yeah, Good. thanks for having me. Good. Well, you see, <laughs> we obviously thought well of you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. And thanks to John, uh, Melissa, Istvan for having me back at the Danube Institute. I did have the pleasure of speaking earlier this year on a very different topic, uh, but this is a really timely one. Um, on October 14, so not, not, not m many weeks ago, uh, Australians said no. Uh, they said no to a proposal called a voice to parliament. They said no to the political elites. They said no to racially divisive politics. They said no to radical identity politics being entrenched in their constitution. And they also said no to a failed approach to helping Australia's most vulnerable and most impoverished. And as I said that out loud, I realised that sounds like the start of a political speech. But anyway, I'm, it, uh, uh, hopefully it doesn't continue like that too much in tone. Um, tonight I'm going to explain to you uh, what happened during this Brexit-like moment. And to that end, I'm going to cover three broad things. What was the voice and where did it come from? And that'll involve a little bit of history, uh, setting the scene for, for the debate. What happened across the referendum campaign? And then thirdly, what does the referendum result mean for Australian politics and Western politics more broadly? So, uh, some historical and cultural background, and I think this is my slide. Uh, now, what's going on there? Just a second. Okay, there we go. That's the one I want. Uh, Australia was settled in 1788 by the British. This sounds like it's going to go for a long time, but I'm going to—I'm uh, I, I, not going to give you the whole of Australian history. Actually, before I continue, I want to make one caveat because if there are Australians uh, watching online, which no doubt some will, I think at some point, uh, Australian history is really complicated. I'm a historian, so I'm all too aware of that. I'm brushing over a lot of things here. Okay. Um, and um, I'm setting a narrative that sets up the voice, the, the description of the voice, the voice debate I'm going to give. Okay, so just be aware that I'm I'm painting in very broad strokes, and I recognise it's more complicated than this. Um, so Australia was settled in 1788 by the British, and when the British came to Australia, what they found uh, from their perspective was a rich land. Uh, with plenty of space and potential and only a small number of inhabitants who, who lived very primitive lives. And these were Australia's Indigenous people, or Aboriginal people, as they are sometimes called. And there was contact between white settlers and Indigenous peoples very early on, with some friendly relations and some hostile ones. And as time drew on, the British began settling and establishing townships and farms, and Indigenous peoples sometimes resisted this encroachment, which led to tensions and at times violence between the British and Indigenous populations. And the British came, um, and when they came, they saw a land that was uncultivated, a land that they thought was unclaimed, and which they then made a claim over. And Indigenous peoples themselves, from their perspective, did have a special connection to the land that became Australia. And that connection wasn't really accounted for in the British legal framework. So that sets up one of the tensions that's part of Australian history and part of this conversation. So over time, as Indigenous peoples um, assimilated 
or chose to stay apart from British Australia, the relationship between the two Australias stayed fraught. Sometimes the relationship had been marked by violence and racism, at other times by assimilation and welfare dependency, and often um, by benevolent paternalism on the part of British Australia. Over the 19th and 20th centuries, um, some Aboriginal children were removed from their families and placed in Western or European families. And evidence basically suggests that this occurred mostly because of the situations that the children were in, because of poverty or abuse or alcoholism and similar. And that's a general statement because there are cases that were different, but that's generally the case. In 1967, the Australian Constitution was altered by referendum to allow the federal government to make laws regarding the Aboriginal population, which resulted in a shift in Indigenous policy <clears throat> from the government. So before then, the states, because Australia is a federation like the United States, and before 1967, the states were responsible for Indigenous affairs. So this referendum meant that the national federal government would become responsible. Since 1967, Australia's Indigenous policy has gravitated away from assimilation, which was the general thrust of Indigenous affairs policy before then, and so it's gravitated away from that and towards separationism. That's, that's what I'm calling it, separationism. And by that, I mean that uh, Indigenous activists, many of whom are, ironically were assimilated peoples, successfully lobbied Australia's national government to support Indigenous peoples continuing to live on their land in remote communities in traditional ways. Now, the irony of this is that the people who pushed this kind of policy were and are themselves often university educated, financially well off, living in big cities, working for big firms and corporations and media and universities. They are as assimilated as I am into Australian society. And they're benefiting from their participation in mainstream Australia. <clears throat> and this latter group, this assimilated group, whether they're activists or not, represent around 75% of Australia's Indigenous population. Which, uh, and that 75% now mainly live in cities and have normal Australian lives. That leaves 25% of Australia's Indigenous population not assimilated. Now, the total population of Indigenous Australians is 812,000. It's about 3% of Australia's population as at 2021. And 25% of that 3% are living in ways that could be described as separate to mainstream Australia and often in very remote communities. Since the 1970s, government policy has been uh, to shift, has, has tried to shift the emphasis away from assimilation and towards separation. Um, so Indigenous peoples have tended to be simultaneously supported in their education and in their income and in their cultural lives and they're incentivized to get a good education and good jobs. And at the same time, they're supported to live in these remote communities far away from mainstream Australia economically and socially and geographically. At the same time as this policy was developed and expanded, and remember I'm painting in very broad strokes because this narrative is covering decades and decades and in some cases centuries, uh, but this, this uh, more separationist policy was developed um, and expanded over the previous five decades. And at the same time as this was developed, um, an activist movement of Indigenous Australians moved to argue for Indigenous land rights. These arguments are made on the basis that Australia was supposedly invaded by the British, that British policies toward Indigenous populations were genocidal, and these are the kinds of words that are used, invasion and genocide, and they argue that Indigenous populations are owed more than just opportunities to become part of mainstream Australia. And the early 1990s were a watershed time in this regard. In 1991, the report on the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was published. 
And interestingly, the report found that Indigenous deaths while incarcerated were not any higher than non-Indigenous deaths. That was what the report was ostensibly looking for, but it didn't find that it was any worse than non-Indigenous populations. But that same report argued that the incarceration rates of Indigenous peoples, which are significantly higher than non-Indigenous peoples, okay, so that's true. Those higher incarceration rates, it was argued, were affected by historical factors of the kind that I've described. People being taken from their families and put into other families in particular. And so this report then led to a movement to recognise what we in Australia call the stolen generations, uh, which is a blanket term to refer to Indigenous peoples who were taken uh, from the care of their parents and families and put into other families. And this, <coughs> this, uh, this label of stolen generations is controversial uh, because, as I said, um, often these people were taken out of their families for reasons that are understandable. It's complicated, but I would say that's generally the case. Okay, we're getting toward the referendum, everyone, don't worry. But I do, this is really important for us to understand the nature of the debate that's been going on in Australia. In 1992, the High Court of Australia recognised the existence of pre-colonial land rights within the system of Australian common law. And this ruling opened the way for Aboriginal native title claims, including, for example, an enormous one, that's currently under consideration in the Redlands in Queensland, which is where I live. Australia has since uh, adopted or been subjected to, depending on your perspective, a range of special days and events that are intended to bring us as a nation closer to reconciliation, reconciliation between Indigenous Australia and, and white or European Australia. And these include things like Reconciliation Week, and NIDOC Week, or National Aboriginal and Islanders Day Observance Committee Week, and National Sorry Day, which is held on the anniversary of the then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's formal apology for the Stolen Generations and to the Stolen Generations. And all of this <clears throat> is now topped off by, and I have to be honest uh, here, with it, this is all topped off by the tiresome, repetitive, obsequious, welcome to country and acknowledgement of country ceremonies and rituals. And this has become quite overwhelming in the Australian experience in the last, just the last few years. For example, these ceremonies occurred at the beginning of every game of the FIFA Women's World Cup. So if you watched any of the Women's World Cup, you would have seen one of these at the beginning of each game that you watched. Um, one occurred prior to a performance that I, I attended recently of Benjamin Britten's War Requiem which my daughter was performing in, in the children's choir, and the welcome to country went for around 10 minutes. So Britain's War Requiem goes for about 90. We got, got an extra 10 at the start of the welcome to country, which in and of itself is not actually a bad thing to watch or listen to. It's not, it's not a problem. Um, but the attitude of Australians is starting to be, well, I'm not sure if I need to be welcomed to my own country anymore. <clears throat> Each time I fly with Qantas, which is Australia's national airline carrier, Customers are subjected to an acknowledgement of the traditional owners and custodians of the land. I flew into London last week, and as we landed in London, we received a traditional, an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians and owners of the land in London, which doesn't really make much sense, does it? But it's just what Qantas do in every flight. Uh, and this is all to provide a bit of historical and cultural background to the voice campaign. Because uh, for decades, uh, Australia has, Australians have been told that they're racist, that we invaded our own country, and that Indigenous peoples are oppressed, and that we all have post-colonial guilt and are living on stolen land. So this is a narrative that we're being told. Yes, Australia's history is complicated. Okay, I acknowledge that. But we're being told this very negative narrative, I think, for a particular reason. But the facts are more complex than that. 812,000 Indigenous Australians are the beneficiaries of over $33 billion in federal government funding every year. So that's $41,000 Australian dollars per person 
for benefits and other special government funds that go to people just because they are Aboriginal. That's the only reason that they get them. And that's not including uh, the raft of other welfare benefits that Australians also have access to, whether they're Aboriginal or not. The majority of Indigenous peoples have access to everything or most things that mainstream Australians have access to on balance. So the $33 billion mentioned before uh, is on top of that. And it's often funnelled through Aboriginal industry groups and bodies who administer the money. And it's not always clear where it ends up, which is something that some of the uh, no campaigners uh, from Indigenous communities were uh, concerned about. And this is where things stood at the beginning of 2023. All right. Oh, now this is just a depiction of life. So I, I, I didn't forgot about this slide. Um, this is a depiction of what you will see if you go into a remote Aboriginal community. Uh, I've been to these communities before and the people who live there are actually genuinely lovely people. The children are wonderful. The adults I've spoken to are kind and generous, generally speaking. But it's, life is hard in these communities, as you can see. It's, it's, like having a, a con it's like having a developing country in the middle of one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what it's like. All right, that's just to give you a bit of a picture. This is not a reflection on the character of Indigenous people, by the way. This is just what some of their lives are like. And it's hard. It's hard for them. All right, here's the man himself, Anthony Albanese. Uh, the Prime Minister, on his uh, election night victory sp uh, in his election night victory speech in May 2022, he announced that his headline policy would be that he would hold a referendum to enshrine an Indigenous voice to Parliament in the Australian Constitution. The Federal Parliament considered the bill, which contained the question and the constitutional amendment, with the Conservative, Liberal Party and National Party members reporting to amend the bill or reject it entirely, so there was dissent but the bill passed and the referendum date was announced by the Prime Minister on August this year, August 30, sorry, this year. And the wording of the referendum is as follows. Oh, actually, this, this is just a bit of an indication to you when this is the polling data, okay? So the green line is support for the yes in the referendum and the red line is the support for no. And this goes all the way back to the, I think this goes all the way back to May 2022. So when the Prime Minister started, announced that he was going to do it, okay? So you can see support is extremely high at that point for, yes. I might come back to that slide if I, I get to. Uh, here's the wording of the referendum that uh, Australians were confronted with on October 14. I propose law to alter the constitution to recognize the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Do you approve this alteration? And it was a simple thing. You just had to write yes or no in the box. Um, the proposed amendment is as follows. Sorry for this slide if it's a bit small. I tried to make it as big as I could. So it's a new chapter in the Constitution for the purpose of recognising uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. In recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the Parliament sub shall, subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. Okay, so that was the proposed amendment to the constitution that Australians were voting on. Um, the Prime Minister and the Yes campaigners provided no details about how this would actually work in practice. They simply stated that what the Australian people were deciding upon uh, was the question with the details to be worked out after the referendum. And they insisted upon this the whole campaign. Now, it's important to note that at this point in the narrative that constitutional amendments of this nature in Australia are usually... Uh, carried out or referendums are usually carried out with an extensive consultation process which includes constitutional conventions that provide lots of people an opportunity to contribute their thoughts and ideas on the proposal and they tend and it would make people feel like they've had some say in the final shape of the proposal however that wasn't how this was handled 
Rather, there was a very particular consultation that was only available to Indigenous leaders. And this happened many years ago now. So in 2017, there was a uh, convention of Indigenous leaders and they approved, without unanimity, I should point out, the Uluru Statement from the Heart. I think, yep, here's a picture of the Uluru Statement from the Heart with all the signatures. <clears throat> uh, so this is... The, the convention that the that the uh, the governments of Australia used to uh, put forward the voice as representative of indigenous people's views, uh, which actually wasn't the case in the end, but they were they were claiming that most uh, that a large percentage of indigenous people agreed with it. Um, the Uluru statement emphasizes indigenous sovereignty the structural injustice that Indigenous people are suffering under, and they state that there is an urgent need to, and I quote, empower people, our people, to take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice, in, voice enshrined in the Constitution. And this, uh, this Uluru statement was the thing that Mr Albanese was promising to implement in full after the referendum. Now, I'm just uh, going to go back to the polling slide because it's very interesting. <laughs> At the beginning of the process, when the Prime Minister announced his plans, polling was almost 75% in favour of the Indigenous voice to Parliament. Can you believe it? 75%. The Prime Minister revealed his draft wording in July 2022, and from that point, things turned south. The Conservative opposition came out as formally opposed to the referendum, <clears throat> with both coalition partners in the on the Conservative side being entrenched as supporting the No campaign by April 2023. And polls at this point were still comfortably in favour of the voice. I haven't got the dates on here, but I think it's somewhere. So there's still, a, there's still a comfortable margin, 60-40, in favour of the voice. Um, okay, so let's talk about the campaigns. <clears throat> this is not a joke slide, um, especially the one here, if you recognise him. So joining the Labor government in campaigning for the yes vote were a large group of Aboriginal elites, including high-profile law academics and Indigenous activists, some of whom were known to be quite radical in their views. And the yes side quickly gathered celebrity endorsements, including the completely irrelevant endorsement of Shaquille O'Neal, the washed-up former NBA star. I'm not sure why they thought that was a good idea. But anyway, here's a photo of, of the endorsement. Uh, they got numerous sports stars and actors and actresses and musicians and academics, and the, uh, at least he's famous in Australia, the famous singer John Farnham lent his most famous vo song called The Voice to the campaign. And along with this group of superstar endorsements, <clears throat> uh, they had the Yes campaign had the support of Australia's professional sports code, including Australian foot, the Australian Football League, the National Rugby League, Football Australia, which is our soccer association, uh, Tennis Australia, Rugby Australia, and a number of high-profile clubs. It also had the backing of Corporate Australia with companies like Qantas. Now, this uh, this photo here is a picture of Alan Joyce and the Prime Minister. Alan Joyce is the CEO of Qantas, which is our national airline carrier. And you can see there he's got put on the side of his planes, yes. So they, they, backed, it, they backed it in with uh, free tickets for all the yes campaigners as well on any flights during the campaign. Uh, and to top things off, the campaign, uh, the yes campaign raised $40 million for their war chest. And I should point out, they had the unofficial help of the state media. Um, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, of course, was officially neutral, but it definitely was not actually neutral. <coughs> they were, uh, in practice, campaigning for the yes vote. The no um, campaign was a stark contrast. Uh, they had the federal opposition in their corner. Yes, that's helpful, but there were significant weaknesses. Those who were arguing for no were branded consistently as bigots and racists. Even some, if someone had impeccable non-racist credentials, indeed, even if they were indigenous themselves, uh, it was not credible to argue for no. 
So no celebrities wanted to lend their brand to no, no sports clubs, no sports stars, and nor did they have any corporations or sporting codes backing them. And they raised a quarter of the, uh, the money that the Yes campaign raised. So they had $10 million compared to 40. So the question at this point has to be, how did Yes lose, right? That's a really interesting question. Uh, how did they lose so resoundingly? Now, as the campaign played out, the Prime Minister and those arguing for Yes demonstrated a disconnect to normal Australian people. They used um, elitist, insulting language to characterise their opponents, falling back on old tropes like racist and you know ignoramus to label those who dared question their proposal. I'm just trying, I'll come back to that in a second. And this doesn't play well. I don't think it plays well with any people really, but it doesn't play well with Australians. And especially it doesn't play well if you actually don't give any information about what's going to happen if your proposal wins. Uh, Jacinta Price uh, said at the end of the campaign when she was asked about whether her, that she was, she was, I'll come to Jacinta in a minute, but she was arguing for no. And she said, oh, did your side use misinformation or disinformation? She said, no, the problem was that the yes, it was a no information campaign. The yes camp didn't give any information, but we'll come back to that. Um, as you will recall from above about the proposal, there's no details about how it would work. And the Prime Minister refused to explain how it would work in practice over and over and over, even when he was asked. The only thing he said is, the Monday after the vote, um, I'm going to appoint a team to begin fleshing out the proposal once the referendum's been won. Now, the problem with this approach is that Australians are constitutionally conservative and historically, it's very difficult to win referendum campaigns in Australia. I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the precise number of referendums there have been, but it's over 40 and only eight have ever been won. So it's actually a hard, it's a hard hill to climb up at the best of times. Um, when someone comes making a proposal that cannot be explained properly and appears to add a fourth arm to the constitutional structure of the country, people get suspicious, and they did. Um, as I said, the No campaign, uh, his, this is the no, uh, some pictures of the No campaign, and it was headed by two uh, powerful Indigenous leaders. Warren Mundine is the gentleman in the T-shirt on the right, and the real superstar... I couldn't actually, I couldn't get the slides to make Jacinta Price the big, the big picture, but this lady here, uh, Jacinta Napajimpa Price, was an, she's become a political rock star. That's actually the main thing that Anthony Albanese achieved, was making Jacinta Price a political rock star. She, she's an amazing lady. I got to meet her the other day in person, and I was like, so exciting, you know, because she's, she was a real star. And both of the, these were the two headline Indigenous leaders. Tony Abbott, who's a friend of the Danube Institute, was a leading campaigner as well against it. And there were a number of others, but uh, Jacinta Price and Warren Mundine were the main ones. And both of these Indigenous leaders were vehemently opposed to the, uh, the proposal for The Voice for two reasons, which were both reasons in the end that resonated with the Australian people. The first reason is that they argued The Voice would divide the nation by race. And the second reason was that the voice would entrench an, an approach to Indigenous affairs that does and has done more harm than good. And that's part of the point, actually, that it, this is entrenching what's already come before. Mundine and Price argued cogently and powerfully that the Aboriginal industry, in, I'm using scare quotes there, the Aboriginal industry, headed by the activists and elites that were leading the Yes campaign, was actually, in a sense, keeping people in poverty and keeping the most needy Indigenous peoples in situations of violence and child abuse and abject suffering and cultural regress. If you visit um, a remote Indigenous community, like the ones I showed you pictures of before, most of the time you see people living in conditions that are some of the worst in the world. And, it's also, and I want to emphasise this is not a reflection on the people who live there and their character, it's just their living conditions. Indigenous children suffer horrendous rates of child abuse, as in utterly horrendous. Um, they have extremely high levels of failing to attend school 
and they have very bad malnutrition. Indigenous peoples have very, very high levels of alcoholism and drug abuse and unemployment if they live in these communities. Many cannot speak English and they have no prospect of being fully educated. And that's the reality for 25% of Indigenous people who live outside of mainstream Australia. And this is what was driving Mundine and Price in their arguments. It was those people. They were worried that the voice was going to keep them in that situation. And they're being kept there, they argued, by a false cultural ideal of connection to tradition and culture and land. But the fact is that very few Indigenous people practice the traditions and ways of their peoples anymore with any rigour. Simply living 2,000 kilometres away from the nearest major city does not mean you're living a traditional Aboriginal life. And so Price and Mundine, along with the No campaign, did not want their people to be stuck in abject poverty and in patterns of abuse and, in, and stuck in welfare dependency. So they argued against the proposal for that reason because they believed that if the proposal got up, those people would be stuck in those situations. Because in a sense, it was actually a vote. If you were voting yes, you were voting for the status quo because it would entrench the status quo in terms of policy and in terms of Indigenous uh, affairs. All right, so what, what happened and what does it mean? Uh, so I'm, I'm almost there. So October 14 came around with the polls getting progressively worse and worse until that date. And the result actually was very accurately reflected in the, in the polling. So recent elections around the world, have there's been some dicey polling and things haven't worked. This was completely accurate. The latest polls were showing a 60-40 loss for the referendum and that's exactly what happened. 60%, just over 60% rejected the proposal and just under 40% uh, uh, supported it. Um, in order to win, you have to win a majority of voters and it's a, it's a, Australia is a uh, compulsory voting system, so everyone over 18 who's a registered voter has to vote. And so you have to win a majority of those voters in a referendum, and you also have to win a majority of states. So four out of seven states have to say yes. No states said yes, and 60% of people said no. So it was a big loss. And so the red, I mean, uh, I won't go into the details here, but what, what the map shows is that there's red all over the country, which is a no. Uh, the, these, um, these here are the cities, and you can see it's a little bit more varied in the cities. I'll go into some of the details um, in a second. But it seemed, why did this happen? It seems that this happened for four reasons. First, the Yes campaign refused to release information about how the proposal would work in practice, and this is a big mistake given that the suspicion that Australians uh, treat constitutional referenda. Uh, the second reason that this happened, partway through the campaign, more information was discovered about the Uluru Statement from the Heart, that, that um, convention, constitutional convention document. Uh, over and over, everyone said, no, it's just a one-page document, it's just a one-page document. Why do you keep getting told it's just a one-page document? Because it's not. There were another 26 and they all got published. Some of, the, some of that got published in my magazine in Quadrant and in other places. Peter Credlin uh, brought it all into light on national TV. Uh, it turns out that the, the so-called advisory body or the voice to parliament wasn't actually the final goal. The other 26 pages that sat behind uh, as a record of the convention showed that the goal was a treaty between Indigenous Australians and white Australians and also a truth-telling to try and recast Australian history. I won't go in too much into that, but a treaty is particularly significant because that would actually bring Indigenous land rights under international law, which are much more expansive in terms of the right access to rights that you have if you're an Indigenous person. Okay, so that's the second reason, was that there was more information that came out about what really lay behind the proposal. The third reason, the Yes campaign um, refused to uh, face the fact that Indigenous policy has up until now failed. And they wouldn't see that um, continuing in the same vein was not a popular option. And so what, need, what was needed actually, the Australian people really wanted a complete restructure, not an entrenched status quo. And the fourth reason, the Yes campaign treated those who disagreed with them in a res disrespectful way. Uh, one, one Yes campaigner, Marcia Langton, who was one of the leading Indigenous um, Yes campaigners, had a sort of basket of deplorable, deplorables moment when she uh, a, a, a video recording of her leaked 
saying that all of the arguments from the no side were undergirded by racism and bigotry, which uh, the press had a field day with, of course. And this was a pattern repeated throughout the campaign. Now, the aftermath has seen similar washdown tactics to other places, claims of racism, misinformation and disinformation, claims that the leading no campaigners were coconuts, they're black on the outside and white on the inside, and the yes campaign are now moving to try and achieve their goals in other ways. But the referendum was a huge result for Australian politics, and the voting data, which I guess is, this is a picture of, show a clear divide between inner city elites and everyone outside of those inner city areas. Apart from a few exceptions, the yes vote was all concentrated in inner cities. The no vote dominated everywhere else in the country. And why did this happen? I'm almost done, so I'm, I'm sorry if I've gone a little bit too long. But why did this happen? The broader implications are numerous, but I, he, here's, here's part of it. I think the yes campaign failed to take account of the mood of the electorate. Uh, the average Australian voter is actually facing things like inflation, just as you are here in Hungary. It's not as bad in Australia, but it's still a factor. Cost of living difficulties, rising interest rates. The question probably became for people, why should I vote for this when I have to think if I can even afford to pay for my kids' swimming lessons? Or for cornflakes, you know, even worse, right? So those who voted yes were in the inner cities. And those, cities have, those areas have recently swung left, particularly on environmental issues. In other words, I think the yes vote was marked by what's called post-materialist politics. So people who voted no were still worried about material things, about their mortgage, food prices, petrol prices. People who voted yes aren't worrying about that. They can virtue signal with their vote a bit more. Second, uh, second analysis, point of analysis, the yes campaign um, carried themselves in a similar way to the Remainers in the UK and the US Democrats in recent years. And these elites and inner city types seemed to find it hard to understand why anyone, how could anyone, you know, how could anyone disagree with their glorious plan? It's, it's impossible for them to understand. Why wouldn't we entrench race, racial division into the Australian constitution? You know? but, they, but, but they didn't realise that this was a problem for the average voter. They had no connection to them. And finally... Despite claims to the contrary, uh, and this is something that Jacinta Price helpfully emphasised over and over, and it's true, Australia is not a racist country. It's not. And therefore, um, there are racists in Australia, by the way, <laughs> as there are in every country, but it's not a racist country. Um, and so, therefore, Australians didn't like being called racist. And they rejected what was a racialist proposal, to have a constitutional body defined by race. So in short, identity politics didn't work in this case. So what I've, this, I've called this an Australian Brexit moment basically because there was this divide between the elites and everyone else. And I think it proves that Western conservatives can take back lost ground with common sense. And they can take back lost ground with the rejection of the politics of grievance and identity. And I think the other thing it shows, and I think this will become more keenly felt in the West as, as uh, the coming years progress, uh, is that people will continue to vote on the material matters of life. Uh, petrol prices, interest rates, welfare checks. <laughs> I don't know um, whether, there's good, whether there's food in the supermarkets. Those things actually shift votes. Abstract ideas about justice and race and things actually don't. When, when the going gets tough, people will vote for, uh, for the material things of life. So I, I think that's, that's where I'll leave it. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. I thought an authoritative and comprehensive account, and um, which I think even people um, people who arrive here knowing nothing about the subject would I think greatly benefit from, as well as those as well as the analysis which uh, some may and some may not agree with. Um, Jeremy Carl, I mentioned, uh, Jeremy has been a fellow here before, and we're welcoming him back. I should have also mentioned his connection, of course, with the Claremont Institute, where he's also a fellow, and which is one of the most, I think, impressive 
um, um, institutes of uh, academic analysis and political um, argument in the United States uh, on the right. It's uh, in recent years it has come to play a major role. Um, uh, Jeremy, your point of view. Thank you. Thanks very much, John, and, and thanks, Simon, for a, let's see if I can, uh, a really interesting presentation. Um, and, I, and I think both of you touched on this, but John had particularly mentioned it. I think it's it's really worth, worth mentioning, at least in some of the remarks I'd like to give in response. There's the issue itself, which is a fascinating issue, but what is, I think, even more interesting in a global context is a situation where you get all of the great and good, all the better saying one thing, and the voters very resoundingly saying another thing. We saw that with Trump, we saw that with Brexit. We're seeing that here. I think uh, sort of Australia's Brexit, and I had followed this you know, before I came here because it, it was big enough that even though in the US we often do a very shoddy job of covering uh, things internationally, but it did in fact uh, permeate the great American bubble and, and, and you know, it was, it was, I took an interest in it. Um, even before I had a chance to, to speak a little bit with Simon about it. Um, and so I do think that that broader concept is really useful. And what I'm going to do in some of my remarks is also talk about other ways in which particularly this indigenous issue plays out in, uh, in the United States and I think elsewhere. Um, I think, again, um, there is, it's also interesting to me because, and, and Simon is a super nice guy, as you could probably tell. Uh, maybe this is like an Australian thing. It probably is. Uh, John is very polite because he's British. Uh, Americans were very sort of obnoxious, and we have lots of guns. So I'm going to kind of give you <laughs> the very obnoxious American view, which is like when I look at all of these things uh, with pushback on kind of special indigenous rights and racial division, I sort of see, wow, okay, there actually may be a shred of self-respect left in uh, European descendants in Australia, in America, in the UK, that there is a certain amount of abuse that we're actually not willing to take. And I think you're beginning to see kind of a pushback where it's really just become too much. Yeah. It's like the, the sorts of things that are going on are just like, people are not just gonna let themselves be talked about this way. They're not gonna be willing to be accused of being racist when they're not racist. They're not gonna be willing to be accused of being dividing the country when they're not trying to divide the country, et cetera. And so I think that sort of broader thing is, is something that is really going on here. Um, other sort of similar things we saw, I think where, where you had this, this, this type of lineup uh, in California, just even recently, which is actually a very multicultural, multi-ethnic state uh, in the United States, there was an affirmative action uh, referendum that went on the ballot. An affirmative action uh, for the non-Americans here is, is essentially it's a racial preference system. Um, and about 20 plus years ago, to people's surprise, uh, Californians effectively outlawed affirmative action. And there was a feeling that, well, now uh, California is even so much more diverse. It was already pretty diverse 20 plus years ago. but Affirmative action is going to win uh, overwhelmingly. We're going to we're going to put it back uh, again. All the money was on the pro affirmative action side of that debate. Every single person, the entire Democratic Party, which runs the state, everybody was for it. And surprisingly, it was defeated resoundingly. I mean, even surprising to me, who sort of follows the backlash to some of this stuff, it was re defeated resoundingly in a very uh, multi ethnic state. It's a you know I think thirty six percent or something now. Uh, white non-Hispanic state and, and you know every single group that you could imagine is in California that was representing themselves at the ballot saying that thing. Um, so again, voters saying no, uh, or so voters saying uh, no when, when elites are saying that yes, you have to do this. Um, I think they're saying no to the institutionalization of racial identity politics. Simon really touched on that, uh, that all of the, the sorts of dangers of that. Uh, no to these sorts of vague vague things that the left is great at driving a truck through, right? Like these, <laughs> these kind of vague, amorphous, airy, pleasant sounding statements where now we should have many decades of experience in seeing just how those work out, which is they will say one thing, it's, it's always a lie. Um, it always turns out that they kind of take these very amorphous, pleasant sounding concepts, and then they put in very, very radical politics that um, nobody would have ever agreed to uh, 
um, if they had understood what they were voting for. Even if you follow the early debates on the Civil Rights Act in the United States, which was, uh, you know, which passed uh, very contentiously, but there were certain things that were very explicitly said in the legislative debate around that, that of course it's not gonna do this, and of course it's gonna do this, and uh, it was passed on that basis, but then you look and we ended up doing all the things that we're explicitly told uh, were not going to happen. Um, a little bit closer to home, uh, for me, I live in a, a very a rural, remote part of the United States, a uh, state called Montana. Again, some of you uh, may be familiar uh, with it. And one interesting thing we have in common is we actually have, uh, although it's, it's actually, uh, we have very few minorities in Montana, but the one very sig significant minority we have is a significant uh, indigenous population. Uh, it's the fifth highest of any state. We have about 7% indigenous. And in fact, they have reservations um, that are about 40% the size of Hungary that they have effectively pretty full sovereignty over. I mean, the uh, native law in the United States, as I'm sure it is with indigenous law in uh, Australia is very complicated, but they, they do have a tremendous amount of authority in those areas. This is a state that at a baseline is really, really remote. I mean, really remote. I'm, I'm, I'm like 10 hours drive from anything that you would really call a city. Um, in, uh, in any, and I'm not talking Budapest level even, I'm just talking about like a, a substantial city. Um, so we're a remote state at a baseline and these reservations in general, we have seven of them, are the remote of the remote. And so the opportunities there are really poor and the, the entire policy that we've had of natives uh, in the US has kind of, it's reinforced this system that I think ultimately deprives opportunities, right? And, and we have a similar type of thing going on um, where we have our native uh, elites that live in the cities such as we have them in Montana. Again, these are small places, but, but big by the standards of Montana. And they are getting a lot of the benefits of this uh, sort of policy. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of suffering when you go into these communities. They are in general, not exclusively, depends on which one, but, but they're in general very, very depressed areas. Um, meanwhile, though, even on the right, you have uh, in America some of these um, land policies. And again, I just think it's a, it's a, a good parallel to what, what Simon was talking about. Uh, the Supreme Court has taken even a couple of justices on the right an increasingly aggressive um, view of the land rights of indigenous people. Um, I have mixed views on that. I mean, there's actually some justifications for where you can understand why they want to do that. I mean, there are treaties that were put in place. And in some cases, those treaties really weren't honored. The question is sort of like, what do you do about that 150 yeah. years after it was done? Like, what's the right way to go forward? So I don't, I don't mean to trivialize that, but you have a lot of these same sorts of things going on. Um, the Supreme Court recently uh, functionally <laughs> ended up giving half of Oklahoma effectively back to, to Native Americans. Um, and uh, they kind of pulled back from that a little bit when they understood kind of the full radicalism of, of what they'd unleashed. But I mean, it just shows that I think these are very live um, live issues um, that we, we are dealing with. We have some of the stolen generations thing. We don't call it stolen generations, but for those of you who followed the debate in Canada with boarding schools, same type of thing. I mean, truly like a moral panic going on. We're beginning to have this in Montana as well. So I think, again, the fascinating thing, and John touched on this, is um, you have similar things going on in a variety of different areas. We have land acknowledgments. Similarly, I sit on a state board in Montana, was appointed by the governor. Again, we're a very conservative state, but the kind of liberal elites that control this board we have to sort of acknowledge that uh, actually effectively we're on somebody else's land, right? Which I don't accept as an American, but uh, you know, th that, that having been as it may. Um, so I don't wanna take up too much time, but I think there's just, there's a lot of parallels in what Simon's saying. It's both a, it's a fascinating kind of issue in and of itself, but I think it's even more fascinating as a representative of broader cultural currents that are going on in the West right now and really worth exploring over time. So thank you very much and uh, happy to turn it over. Well, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank my two uh, predecessors. Um, I am dealing in a slightly 
of, I'm dealing with um, uh, responding rather to um, Simon's paper uh, on the opposite position from, uh, uh, opposite only in a very narrow sense from um, uh, Jeremy, because I'm looking at the international developments of which this is a part. Um, and one of the most interesting that, and the first thing one notices is that and I'm not going to discuss all the issues in the referendum, obviously. Um, immediately after the uh, no vote had triumphed, the advocates of the yes vote res immediately resorted to the argument that was referred to by both of you, the argument of racism. In other words, they attempted to argue that the referendum result was in some sense illegitimate. Now, I won't give a lot of arguments about the Australian Constitution, except to say that no one has been able to make a strong case that it has in any sense a racist character, because the very first uh, days, it set out to ensure that Australians of all races should be able to participate in government. Um, why, therefore, do, they, do the um, advocates of the uh, uh, yes vote do this? Um, well, I think um, it is because that they want um, uh, uh, nothing will prevent the accusation of racism uh, as an explanation because it is popular electoral democracy um, which is the target. Popular electoral democracy is increasingly seen as problematic by governments, by the UN by international bodies, by the courts domestically and internationally, by transnational political elites, and above all, by the left progressive political movements around the world. Um, the problem, which explains problematic, that they have in mind is that the voters cannot be relied upon to support the policies that the left progressive parties and the establishments which they now increasingly dominate within Western and particularly Anglosphere societies. And they can't, the voters can't be relied upon to support the policies that these groups believe to be necessary or essential, valuable, invaluable, and moral. They can never quite state that problem candidly or openly because democracy retains a worldwide status as the only respectable form of government in an advanced modern country. So they have to devise various methods of, of overriding, going around, or in general outwitting the voters when they don't deliver the votes in elections or referendums that the left progressives want. Obviously, charges of racism are one such ploy because they can be used to morally devalue the votes of entire classes of people. For example, the white working class, which is increasingly treated as ipso facto racist without any argument being made to, suggest, to prove that. Um, uh, and um, they, they, once you've done that, uh, then you can cite that as a reason why the courts or treaties should override or qualify the results of elections. Britain's Brexit vote, as we can see from the poster, was widely ascribed by the international media, especially the New York Times, to racist motives. Even though statistics of comparative racism clearly show the UK to be the least racist nation in Europe. And, and as Simon said, Australia enjoys a similar reputation internationally. But racism is only one such device and, um, and not always useful to people who want to get around an election result they don't like. Um, a quick world survey shows other many, many other useful techniques. Much the easiest, or the best, I should say, is to constitutionalize the policies and rights that left progressives want, so as to remove them from reform or amendment by governments of a different political character, sometimes governments that have been elected specifically to reform or amend those policies. That was most recently and most ambitiously attempted by the left progressive Chilean president, Gabriel Boric, who supported the passage of a new constitution that according to a sympathetic New York Times and a sympathetic New Yorker would have legalized abortion 
mandated universal health care, required gender parity in government, given indigenous groups greater autonomy, empowered labor unions, strengthened regulations restricting mining, and guaranteed rights to nature and animals. Now, many or most of these policies might well be worthwhile, but they are also the stuff of normal democratic political debate and decision. Uh, and that's uh, one important reason for thinking they should be determined by the voters. The second is that once you constitutionalize a right or a policy, then you cannot really have trade-offs between that and other attractive policies. The money you spend on them, or are required by the Constitution to spend on them, can't be spent on different goals that may be equally or more desirable in the eyes of the voters. In Chile's case, the proposed 100-plus rights covering housing, education, clean air, food, internet access, free legal advice, and care from birth to death, once you constitutionalize them, that would have crowded out spending on virtually every other aspect of activity of government, and it would have required massive hikes in taxation. Well, that's what Chile's voters decided, because in, in September, uh, uh, they rejected the proposed, last year, they rejected the proposed constitution in a referendum by 62 to 38 percent. And earlier this year, they voted heavily for conservative candidates to be members of a new constitutional convention to draw up a new constitution. Now, um, if they are sensible and genuinely conservative, they will draft a constitution that c concentrates on safeguards for procedural fairness in government, including elections, and leaves policy and administration to the voters and their representatives. Um, they have actually presented a new constitution which is significantly more conservative. It's hard to be sure from this distance whether or not they overreached as Boric did. Uh, my suspicion is they haven't, but of course, uh, the, most of my information necessarily comes from fundamentally left-wing sources because um, it's only left-wing newspapers appear who think we're interested in these things. Um, and, uh, but the mistake that Boric made was not to restrain his progressive allies from promulgating excessively leftist rules. And because of the formal constitutional process meant that those in Chile those proposals had to be fully spelled out to the voters. A maximalist program meant a minimization of electoral support. At lesson one, don't tell the voters what's inside the packet. And as we've heard from Simon, Australia's Labour government did the very best to observe this lesson by insisting the voice was a one-page deal of mainly humanitarian and ceremonial significance until the Peter Credlin, as you mentioned, at Quadrant, I think, above all, and the political leaders you mentioned, managed to persuade people, look, you should really know what you're voting for. Um, and it, it, it failed. So constitutionalizing your favorite political position runs into a difficulty, which is it's a high profile public activity. It's difficult to conceal. And when you can't conceal, and what you're doing is revealed, that forces its proponents into all kinds of undignified postures of denial and casuistry. So, left progressives have come up with a more subtle and discreet method of evading democracy. Several. Uh, the first I will mention is sortition. That is choosing your voters in the old-fashioned way, by lot, as in ancient Greece. Um, sortition, in my view, has to be dismissed fairly briskly. First, it's designed to produce a superior citizen politician to the actually run-of-the-mill politicians we now get. Um, but the problem with that is, uh, once, the, uh, once these citizen politicians, admirable grassroots people, uh, become, um, uh, come into office, they become subject to the same status anxiety, ambitions, lobbying pressures from vested interests, and incentives for corruption as today's members of parliament. They become, in a word, politicians. So you're never going to reach uh, 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 nirvana or utopia by that method. 
Second, the election by lot cuts the link between the representative and his constituents. That is the link that makes government by the people a reality. An MP chosen by lot is the representative of chance as much as any monarch. Um, and the voters can't throw him out if he betrays them. And there is a third reason for dismissing sortition. It's never going to happen. It's simply too eccentric uh, to happen in a major country uh, or a, be used in a genuinely important election. On the other hand, it is already happening in smaller political contexts where it's used to select ordinary citizens to serve in citizen assemblies that would then help shape national policy on key issues such as, I bet you can guess, climate change. The eventual aim of activists here, I'll give you an example, uh, the editor of the medical magazine, the, the Lancet, who sees the introduction of citizen assemblies as a kind of medical necessity. Um, the eventual aim seems to be a national citizens' assembly chosen by lot outside the parliamentary system, but having influence or even a veto on legislation. Sensibly, advocates are starting with baby steps. Their first effort was the UK Climate Assembly, in which their parliamentary allies insorted sortition of sorts into the official legislative process on energy and climate policy. Six parliamentary select committees in the UK um, in, in 2019 announced that a climate assembly composed of volunteers from the general public would be used to inform political debate and government policy making, the same point that you made, Simon, about the bill. Uh, following instruction over six weekends um, in, in their meetings, uh, an activist on the, uh, an anti-green activist, Ben Pyle, in a book he wrote, Manufacturing Consent, points out the various ways in which this departed from the principle of sortition and also from the usual rules of good public policy. In the first case, um, the policy, the selection of citizens for the assembly violated the main principle of sortition, its randomness. They were drawn from people willing to devote six weekends to discussing climate policy. Uh, and, and the final 108 members were whittled down further in accordance with age, gender, educational background, ethnicity, home location, and, quote, attitude to climate change. In other words, how, how, were they, how did that last um, criterion work? They had... They were selected to conform with an opinion poll showing that 85% of British voters were either very or fairly concerned about climate change. And just as the members of the assembly were selected on this basis, the experts, too, were unlikely to challenge them. Let me quote Mr. Pyle again. Greenpeace's Doug Parr spoke to the assembly against investing any confidence in technological solutions like greenhouse gas removal. Fernando Bellotta from the New Economics Foundation argued for an economic transformation locating the source of climate change in capitalism itself. Tony Juniper was introduced to the Climate Assembly as being from a UK environment quango, natural England, um, but is best known because of his previous role as Friend of the Earth's uh, England director between 2003 and 2008. There don't seem to have been any experts from a less greenish background, because as one organizer when challenged said, well, climate science is already settled. But the Climate Assembly was established to consider not the science of climate change alone, but the full range of, ac of economic and social policies from agriculture to tourism designed to combat it. That includes the food we eat, the cars we drive, the countries we visit. Given that both the Assembly's ordinary members and its expert advisors were from these backgrounds, it's not surprising that the UK Climate Assembly reproduced the wish list of policies of Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace as what the British people wanted in future policy. Taxes on flying, 
restricting private cars, higher energy prices. In short, net zero policies from which all UK politicians are currently retreating at Olympic rates of speed. The technical term for exercises of this kind is stitch up. Expect to encounter many more of them in Western, particularly Anglosphere politics as alternatives to the use of referendums and elections. Why? Because elections and referendums are systems in which the voters have the final say. And my last remark, as you are sitting here listening to what you must consider to be a slightly remote topic concerned with other countries, the EU Commission has just advocated um, a new treaty that will centralize power in Brussels and remove power from national parliaments still further. And it is expected that um, it is expected that national parliaments, uh, the representatives of the national parliaments in the uh, EU Council, um, will uh, will uh, sanction it and press it along. Um, by the way, uh, there was a climate, uh, there was um, I'm sorry, a citizen a citizen assembly system that approved this more or less in advance. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that this will be an absolute anti-democratic stitch up unless there's a referendum that gives the voters at least the chance of rejecting it. Thank you very much. I now become an impartial chairman uh, again. <laughs> uh, and uh, the first question I'm going to ask is, I just want to pick up your very last remark, Simon, and that is uh, where you said, that I think it was the third of your um, uh, analytical results, that elections would continue to be, not essentially, but I suppose mainly, about material prosperity and material questions. I think I can see that. Um, would you say, however, that questions concerning your child's sexual future, um, gender theory, and those issues, do they not have a similar cutting edge? Uh, yeah, so I, I, that's a... That's a helpful qualification because I completely agree. I guess I would count that as a material. Uh, maybe I need to broaden the category. I think I, I think absolutely things that impact your person, your family, and then your your um, home economy. I, th I suppose uh, or your bank account will, will be things that people will will move on in elections. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, and and it would be interesting to see if the inner I mean I guess the inner city elites in Australia are often progressive now they actually all, they all used to vote right um, and then they've swung left in the last 10 years or so uh, it would be interesting to see whether they're moved by something similar like that my suspicion is they're probably not because all their kids have moved out of home and they're choosing to change their own gender in their own time rather than the school doing it for them but um, I think you're quite right to point that out um, yeah, I, I you know I, I think um, you can definitely get into trouble when you get too far ahead of the voters on some of these cultural issues, and they feel like you're not paying attention to oh I can't pay my bills, right? That's that's a problem. However, having said that, uh, my friend and sometime colleague Inez Stepman is fond of saying the culture war is the big tent. <laughs> I actually, uh, which in, in the U.S. context at least, and I actually do believe that. I mean, I, I think that a lot of these cultural issues are quite powerful. And I don't mean that in a cynical way or that we, I mean, I think they're completely legitimate. I mean, the notion that, uh, to you know, use the one that you're, if, if you're gonna like cut the genitals off of my 12 year old or gonna yeah. let that happen, like I don't really care what your views are on a bunch of other policies and and kind of showing that, that in fact our opponents are so radical that they would contemplate or in fact propose some of these things is very revealing to voters. My next question is, to, again, to both of you, but first, I think, to Simon. Um, what explains the relative slowness to react as the campaign went on um, of the elites on the who were running uh, the Yes campaign and the Prime Minister in particular? Because, you know, the, the figures, the, the, the graph you showed is really startling. And you would have thought that given the gen, in the general elections, people think it's not only the it's not only what's happening now, but the trend 
whether it's whether you can stop a, a trend that's already going full stop, you would have thought they would have realized we are seriously in big trouble and we have to satisfy the, the doubters. Yeah. It, it's a puzzle to me why the Prime Minister didn't just uh, pull, pull the pin and come out and say, I made a mistake... I haven't taken the people with me. I, rec I mean, that would have been the most that would have been the most popular thing to do. Would have been to come out and say, "I made a mistake, and I'm, we're going to do it after the next election. Uh, we're going to consult with everyone." You, that would have been a, it. Would have been better to concede he'd made an error of judgment. I think because uh, Albanese had campaigned on the issue, he'd won an election on it. It was his lead election night victory speech policy. I don't know him. I, 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 he's probably like me, and he's a man of pride, and he probably doesn't want to admit he's wrong, just like I wouldn't. And so, but I, so I, I can understand why he didn't. But I, I was saying to my mother, who, who, you know, I, I respect her, her difference with me on this. She, she supported yes, and she was really troubled that it was losing. And I said, you know, it doesn't have to lose. Uh, in fact, I can imagine voting for a proposal that was different to the one that was put forward. But I can, I can imagine voting for a constitutional amendment that wasn't as uh, far gone as that one um, if they consulted everyone and, and, you know, and did the process properly. I think, I think it's quite plausible to do it. I, I, th I think it was probably too late from their perspective politically and I think it was politics that drove it rather than anything. But don't you think if you'd want you – know, I would have thought if you want to win in the end, you would pull back and try again, but he didn't. No, he didn't. I, I agree. And I, I think it's a mysterious thing, too. I mean, you, you have explained it, and I think plausibly, but um, any comment on this? Yeah, I, I think it's, again, to, to put it in a broader context, the left increasingly exists in a hermetically sealed information environment. Yeah. Um, and they simply are not exposed to uh, contrary opinions in any meaningful way. And so... Uh, they they almost they can't even sort of believe what they're looking at because it's already been decided in their mind. I mean, I, I don't think it's just rhetorical that they're saying, "Oh, if you oppose these things, you're racist, you're whatever." Yeah. It's like they, they they a lot of those folks actually do believe that, and it's one of the reasons why. I mean, I don't debate a lot of lefties anymore, but it's kind of fun and easy to debate them because they're so. Their, their information funnel is so narrow. I mean, we read all their stuff, but they never read our things, with with rare exceptions. And and so, you know, when you when you mention one or two objections to what they're saying, they haven't even thought it through at all. This is what you, you find out. Um, I have a question, another Australian question, and that is to say, most observers thought that Albanese would win this and go on using as a springboard either at the end of his first term or beginning of his second another to introduce another actually more important uh, constitutional referend which is whether or not Australia should retain the monarchy and therefore uh, the present uh, King Charles III. Um, what do you think will now happen? The general analysis in the week after the referendum in the press was that the republic, the idea of a republic in Australia is dead now because it would require a referendum. I think that left the left or any of these, um, so Republican, <laughs> a republic isn't necessarily a left wing thing, but in Australia it is. It just it just tends to be more of a progressive idea. So so with that caveat, uh, I think that anyone on the left is now going to be afraid and scared off from referendums because of the, the extent of this victory was so significant. It's interesting, though, last time the Republic was voted on, which was in 1999, it was a very slim victory to know. It was 51-49, I think. Um, and Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister of Australia for a couple of years, he was part of the, Mer the Australian merry-go-round of Prime Ministers, similar to the British one, but not quite as bad. Uh, he, he led that campaign, and, and, I, and I think... They he, they almost won. They made some similar mistakes uh, back then in terms of silly celebrity endorsements and so on. But it wasn't like they treated people disrespectfully. I I, I think there won't be a vote on on the republic for at least two decades now because I think that they realise it's it's hard to win. Um, is, are there any circumstances at the moment in American politics, uh, Jeremy, either federal or um, state, where you think? Um, there's going to be an effective use um, of um, uh, referendums, referendums, or um, a significant defeat of one. Yeah, and it, it's interesting that you kind of broadly 
contextualize that because I think part of the problem is what made this type of a referendum good and effective, this type of popular democracy is it's extremely high salience and voters have a lot of information on it. That type of popular referendum is actually good. I now go back a little bit to sort of the disastrous ways that referenda are used in states like California where people don't have a lot of information. It's all just coming from advertisements in which there's a lot of money put behind them. Uh, we don't understand them. They're written in corrupt ways that, that we don't um, really uh, get them. And so it's actually, you can cause quite a lot of mischief. Yeah. I'd say one element of popular democracy that is a little bit like that, that I've seen proposed, although I'm personally sort of nervous about it, but I've seen energy from a right, the right in the US, is a sort of convention of the states, a sort of new constitutional convention. Now I think, given the quality of the citizenry these days, yeah. I'm not necessarily eager to open up that uh, that uh, ball of, uh, you know, the, I open up that jar and find out what's, uh, what's an, in the, or what's in the- You're, an, you're an elitist still, is what you're saying. I, what I'm saying is I'm still an elitist. No, but I do think, I think that it, where, where referenda can work yeah. are in very narrow, situations like this where people know about it and they care about it and then they're able to express their voice. That's when it works well. But when you've got nine of them on the ballot in California every two years, that's, uh, that's uh, I think, not a good recipe for democracy. Well, time. you're both political theorists. Uh, and and um, we're talking now about the character of a referendum and the character of representative democracy. Um, and I want to ask you, um, in a, given those are the topics, how do you define democracy, populism, and elitism? Oh, I'm in a soapbox on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's, a, that's, almost, that's too big a question, John. I mean, uh, I, I guess that we can try. We can give it a go. Can I start with democracy? Um, <laughs> democracy is the easiest one because that, that is government by the people. And... The way that that's usually expressed is in elections, but uh, election you elect an elite. That's the, so democracy actually results in a kind of elitism um, in in some form, unless it's a, unless it's a very peculiar democracy like Athens. But even then, they still had an elite. So um, the, your question about populism is is tricky. I have always found that word completely evasive as a as a term. I use it but I don't really know what I mean when I use it in a, in a definitive sense. I'm interested to know what, how you would define populism, but because I've, I've always found it, I mean, I, th I think it's always used as an insult. That's the yeah. part of the problem, but there's something potentially good about it, right? Right. It's a little bit like the term isolationist, that it's kind of very much defined yeah. by the enemies. But, but populism, I think, you know, kind of trusting in the will of the people, it's a certain type of rhetoric yeah. that is a little, maybe a little more pugnacious and, and simple. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't quibble at all with your definition of democracy. I will point out, I was uh, um, uh, just <laughs> the difficulty of all this. I was uh, I was looking over on my phone at at lunch, and my wife got rightly annoyed with me. Uh, will Durant's uh, kind of uh, the great uh, historian, for those of you uh, familiar with him, uh, long since passed, unfortunately. But he basically said, "Ah, democracy, it's it's all a fiction. It's and this is the guy who who wrote the story of civilization, fourteen volumes, who who lived with this for fifty years and was not a, a right winger. I mean, he was sort of a raging moderate. He said it's either oligarchy or monarchy. And if you you know you just think you have democracy sometimes, and I think you do see that in things like Brexit, right? That's where you sort of saw it, where the voters said something." The elites absolutely hated it. And the elites kind of just, I mean, the UK is not back in, but the elites are sort of punishing the voters is sort of how I view what's going on in Brexit. And I will be interested to see in an Australian context, do not think you're out of the woods sure, because yeah. they will come back in and they will try to get this whole loaf through 15 other ways, right? Now, I have a supplementary here and then I'm going to throw it open to the floor. Um, and that is, uh, you are up, I mean, I agree completely, um, Simon, with your argument that democracy is a system in the sense of competitive elites. Yeah. Now, the problem arises, therefore, what happens when there are issues on which the elites are cooperative rather than competitive? And, and over a period of time, uh, a um, what I'd call a sustained and settled public opinion 
um, is seriously divided, um, and and there, and yet no change can occur because the party system doesn't accommodate that. Um, what then uh, do we think about referenda, or do we think there are other ways of dealing? with I mean, it seems to me like this is the situation in the UK, broadly speaking, and it's actually not dissimilar in Australia in that the similar systems, both major parties in the UK and in Australia are, for all intents and purposes, almost the same in terms of policy outlook, uh, and that there are there are minor differences that sometimes emerge into major differences at points. And I think that's a fair summary. And so this is what you're describing. Um, uh, it, the system falls is going to break at some point. It seems to me if that's what continues to happen. I think what will Jack. I think what is happening in Australia, and I think what we're seeing with this vote in the referendum, is that I th I believe that the conservative parties will get a bit more confidence to be conservative, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Whether you're a conservative or not, I think you should say that's a good thing because it means that there's more public discourse that is actually that actually reflects the cleavages in society itself. So I think gradually in Australia we'll see more differentiation, I hope. I, I hope. That's an optimistic outlook. Uh, but I think, I, I think it's, it's something like in the US, uh, things are heading in a less pleasant direction, I yeah. would have thought. I think, John, your, your point about cooperative versus competitive elites just is on the nose. I mean, that's the issue. And, and for a long time in the US, I would argue uh, Romney, Bush, McCain... These were all globalists, and I don't even mean that. I mean, that's now become such a loaded term. I, I just mean in a descriptive sense of how they looked at the world, and certainly all the left in America, for the most part, is globalist. And Trump came out, and I think this is where Orban, and you know, one of the reasons I'm here in Hungary uh, rather than somewhere else, kind of came and said, you know, actually the nation state is really important. The nation is really important. That really matters. It's not that we are going to hermetically wall ourselves off and not engage with other countries, but but that's kind of my unit of analysis that I care about the most. Um, and so I, there's a lot of resistance globally to that uh, from from just about any country that you can, can mention. And what we would hope to get is getting back to a contest of elites where we have a much stronger camp that, say, is advocating for a Hungary first or America first or Australia first or the UK first type of nationalism, and we just don't have globalism A versus globalism B, and that's your choice. And actually, just one yeah, follow-up point, actually. I think the conference we were both at last week and at the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship, or ARC, which some of you might have read about or heard about or even been at, uh, that seems to me like a kind of a regrouping of elites on the right and trying to form a new elite. Like that, and so that, that seems to me like a, a, promising, a promising move. I agree completely. I mean, uh, the, everybody sees that the Conservative Party is in a very difficult position, even if it was to govern very effectively in the year it has left to us. It must still face the likelihood of a serious defeat. And, um, and people are already reacting to that possibility by trying to find ways in which the previous, the, the failures of the previous Conservative Party and personnel, so to speak, to use your point, can be remedied. And I think, therefore, the, the, the Alliance for Responsible Citizenship meeting was an extremely important one. And I think it wasn't widely reported, as, as widely reported as it should have been in the British media. But I noticed that uh, the, uh, uh, the whole conference, uh, broken down into um, manageable parts, is now more or less available online. And I think that it will have an impact. Now, um, I think that I would like to throw the question open to the floor, these questions open to the floor. I do see a, a friend of the Institute um, who knows about Switzerland. There's just been um, a referendum, effectively a referendum in Switzerland. I mean, a parliament, it was about certain things. Do you have any comments on it, Zoltan? Yeah, about the recent election. Which one are you referring to? There are a lot of referendums constantly. Oh, no, I was referring to the, mo the recent election because it was, re it was fundamentally reaffirming the reluctance of the, S of the Swiss, wasn't it, to, um, to, re uh, to, to have much closer relations with the EU. Well, well and, uh, that was not... Re what recently happened now yeah. is that the, uh, the um, 
uh, Volkspartei yeah. has been reinforced. So it's the, the first party, which is considered the extreme right party by the left, <laughs> of course. And, and, and it is, but it's in is the that, government. Uh, but is your microphone working? It's in the government. Just, it's part of the government. Uh, and they have now 29% uh, uh, of the parliament, which is the largest party in, uh, in Switzerland. Mm. That's, that's uh, uh, what happened now because of all the you know, uh, left-wing uh, <laughs> propaganda and all that uh, has, has pushed people towards... And, of course, uh, the, the issue now was um, uh, migration. That was one of the main issues that is going... Uh, also, it's also happening in Switzerland, but of course all around us. There's a lot of problems in France and, and Germany and Italy. Not to talk about Italy. No. Th thank you. Um, no, we have questions from the floor. The gentleman in the row behind you. Thank you. I have a question to uh, Dr. Kennedy. Um, well, as you explained very convincingly, there are uh, a lot of uh, vested interests and big money uh, at play on this side of the yes camp. And uh, we are seeing uh, attempts to somehow circumvent the result of the referendum. Uh, in particular, I know about South Australia, which had the second highest uh, no uh, um, result after Queensland, and they are adopting their own state level voice. Um, without a constitutional amendment. So it, it's being done separately without a referendum, without a constitutional amendment. Um, so it seems, uh, even despite of this uh, overwhelming rejection, it's, it's coming in and it's coming uh, your way. Um, do you think this is going to uh, remain on the agenda? And do you think the left is going to try to... Um, advance uh, the cause of the voice uh, at the sub-national level with an end result um, very similar to what a yes vote would have been. Yeah, so this, it's a mixed picture because uh, you're quite right about South Australia and I think that Victoria is another state which is where I'm from originally and I'm glad I don't live there anymore uh, because politically it's very left-wing but it's... Uh, it's uh, that I think that those states will move toward a sort of uh, what you describe as a state level uh, voice and treaties and so on. Having said that, it was fascinating. I, I live in Queensland, which had the highest no vote in the country. Um, and uh, what happened in Queensland two days after the referendum, the, op uh, the opposition leader and the premier, at the, so these are leaders in the opposition and the government of the state, both backpedaled on their commitment to implementing a state treaty with the Indigenous people. So they both, it was a bipartisan agreement to do that. Both of them realised it was electoral suicide to follow through with this. And uh, of course, they both could have committed suicide and done that at the same time, but the opposition leaders decided he would take advantage of it and then the government, so they, they both pulled back on that. And then a week later, the New South Wales Premier, which is the biggest state in Australia, did exactly the same thing. And he's on the left. He backpedaled on it. So I think there's actually also, there's movement in both directions at the moment. I don't think it's clear what's going to happen. My suspicion is that the at a national level, they might try and implement aspects of the voice with legislation. The good thing about that is that you can reverse that relatively easily if another parliament's elected, then they can vote. They can, you know, they can uh, they can remove that legislation. Uh, but yeah, there, there could be state level voices. It's not clear how important or significant those would be over the long term. So I think it's a mixed picture going forward. It'll be interesting to see. Yes, I think it's also worth remembering that when the Dutch and the French rejected the refer the um, uh, the proposed European Constitution. Uh, which had been widely debated and discussed, actually, in a, in referendums. Um, the uh, the the what and and that was supposed to be a binding uh, re, um, thing. What happened was the Europeans re, re so to speak regrouped, um, um, introduced the same things, um, not called a treaty, but exactly the same content, 
and 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 introduce them via a new set of treaties. And I think that is completely anti-democratic. And indeed, they have, so to speak, confirmed my criticism because they now say they have no intention. I mean, the individual leading politicians in, in the EU have said bluntly, don't ever have a referendum because you don't know how it's going to turn out. Well, you might argue against elections on exactly the same principle. And, and of course, many of them would be perfectly happy to make that because... Um, when you have leaders like um, President, former President Vaclav Klaus um, saying that um, he, he was opposed uh, to further constitutional um, uh, centralization, um, the, the then, um, I think he was president of the council, Herman Rompuy, said um, there can be no democratic decision against the treaties. In other words, what Europe is stuck in at the moment is a, is a system like the old communist system, which is to say uh, um, uh, politics had to be conducted in those days within the limits of socialist power. Now it has to be conducted within the limits of the power of Brussels. That's very serious, and I don't think it's... It's a permanence. It can be guaranteed to be permanent, but it is important. Now, another question from the floor. Yes, the gentleman at the back. I think... If I'm not mistaken, a friend of Aus an Australian, in fact. That's quite right, yeah. <laughs> and a Queenslander, oh, no less. Ex excellent, so glad to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, born and bred, um, and a historian. Uh, and I, I, I really feel like um, I have to ask this. You would recognize that there was a great injustice perpetrated against the native peoples of Australia, right? Yeah, indeed. There certainly were injustices. I'm not sure... I I'm just not sure whether it's an injustice, but there were different. No, no, I, of no, I quite agree you know, with you. You know what I mean. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, uh, John, thank you very much for recognising me. Um, uh, I, and I feel a bit churlish saying this, but I feel I have to bring up the subject of the Australian Constitution. Australia has been a state for 120 years. For 60 of those years, Aboriginals were completely excluded from civil rights. They had no rights whatsoever. Um, as Australian citizens, they were administered by a separate system of justice. There was even a separate police force. Uh, that meant that those people couldn't own any property. Uh, they had no access to, well, anything very much, really. And so there is, and you know, this was only actually resolved at the beginning of the 1960s, so, you know, it's almost within my lifetime. There is a staggering injustice there. Um, and the, to, as to the question of um, genocide, because I, I really feel I should bring this up, as a Queenslander. Yeah, yeah. As a child, I personally knew people who claimed, at least, uh, to be witnesses to the culling of local tribes. They would go out, they would shoot small children and childbearing women. Now, I, you know, I mean, fair enough. Uh, as far as the politics is concerned, I completely agree with you. And the, uh, the referendum deserved to be defeated. But... Your mother's right. You know, there, there, there really was a massive injustice there oh, yeah, that there, needed yeah. to be addressed. So, so in, in, um, in general, I agree with you. And as I, I, it's, it's good that you bring that up because there are details in Australian history, which, like you said, just described now, which are undoubtedly uh, devastating, terrible events. I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not disputing any of that, all the, any of the details of that. Uh, uh, the question of uh, whether Indigenous people had any rights before 1967 or in the early 1960s, I'm not exactly sure what the turning point is you're referring to, but it, I don't think it's quite as simple as that. But they weren't, they weren't, I'm not suggesting for a second they were treated in exactly the same way as British Australians either. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to concede some of the points that you've made. Uh, but I think that the injustices, I even if we concede all the points that you've made, and I'll, I'll throw to you in a second, John, because no. you might know more about this no, than, than me in some ways. Uh, even if we were to concede all the points that you've made quite, quite fairly, I think the role that history has played in this debate has been unhelpful, generally speaking, because it feels to me, it might be easy for me to say this as a, as a privileged, you know, Anglophone Australian, 
But it feels to me as though people want to hold on to all of the terrible things that have happened in the past and there were terrible things that happened. When I, when I actually think what needs to happen is that we need to move on and just help people who need help rather than keep people in misery. So I think that's, that's, that's part of my response to what you're saying. Yeah. But, yeah, you raised some interesting points and I think some good ones. Well, I mean, I'm not an expert on the Australian Constitution, but if you um, – and or about – all of the things which happened um, as a result of uh, the arrival of um, the English and Austra- the British in Australia, but the, there has been, of course, the history war in in Australia about these points. And um, I think, in a recent judgment in his recent book, um, Nigel Bigger tries to assess the result of that, and he comes down very strongly in favour of, uh, of of Keith Windshuttle's uh, account in the fabrication of uh, Aboriginal history, which is to say that many of these things either did not occur or did not occur as they're now generally remembered. And, I, and, and so that would be my first point. I th- believe that there were significant civil uh, uh, rights amendments to the Constitution back um, in bringing, I mean, are we, um, do we have to distinguish here? You know more about this than I do, but and I'm going by uh, some of the debates I've followed. But don't some of the um, um, are there different r- rights for Aboriginals who integrated? So um, the the situation is, I mean, the uh, <laughs> situation as I understand it, is that the only way that an Aboriginal could become an Australian citizen before 1961 was if they joined the army and were honourably discharged. That was literally it. Well, I, I I'd like to. Well, we we should conduct this further on uh, uh, in. Online, I'm happy to, to stay in touch on this because um, what I've read is not is not quite that like that. I mean, it was it, it suggested that really from very early days, maybe not from the very earliest, but well before the 60s, um, the there were rights for the Aboriginals written into the Constitution. So I'll have to go back and look at that and come back to you. Okay. And I'd actually, I'd probably I, I can't speak to the Australian context, but we have similar sorts of discussions in the U.S. And uh, I, I kind of come back on a lot of this to uh, what the American political theorist Thomas Sowell calls the quest for cosmic justice. And that in fact, this just ends up leading most of the time to a great bit more of injustice. And in the context of land acknowledgements, for example, which we talked about, which, uh, what's the Australian term again? Uh, acknowledgement of country. Acknowledgement of country. Um, somebody has suggested, I think quite correctly, that what we should really be doing is saying, we're here on the ancestral uh, lands of the Sioux who exterminated the Kiowa, who kicked out, you know, and that this is the real history, right? Like this is, history is messy, it's violent, there is injustice on all sides from all parties going back and, and for a long time until very, very recently, um, the world was might makes right. I mean, that's just what it was. And, and anybody who would have suggested that was anything else would have been seen as a, a fool or a charlatan. And I think that we'd like to think that we've progressed to a better state than that these days. And I, I think in many ways we we genuinely have, but just to kind of understand that messiness of history to not to not um, to not paper over in any way some of the very bad things that happened yeah, in the past or that uh, Europeans did in the past or whatever, but just to acknowledge that, that history is really messy in that way, that we're never going to have perfect justice, but to what we can try to do is to address yeah. real needs of people who are suffering right now yeah. and go forward on that basis rather than to kind of currently you know, more divide society. I just think that's a better way of doing yeah, things, that's right. both in Australia and in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think to try to find common ground, uh, maybe forcing common ground, I hope not, but uh, the, the Australian, um, cons- the Australian democratic spirit is to try to establish as fair and equal a society as you get. And, and, I, and a friend of mine who was a distinguished Australian, um, a Welshman who went to live in Australia, he once said to me, that he thought Australia had been created on the values of the British working class, and it was one of the fairest and most decent societies in the world. I th- think that second is certainly true. Um, and um, the, the, the purpose of a current or future reform should be to ensure the expansion of that equality to everyone as much as possible. I pose the argument against the voice 
whether um, from your position or from mine, uh, would be to say that we, uh, we, do, we want to have the equality extended, but we don't want to have inequality introduced formally and constitutionally into the Constitution, which of course is one of the points that was raised by Jacintha and, um, yeah. Can I just say one more? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. To be, honest, to be honest, I think this actually strengthens your argument uh, because I, I think that uh, something more than a gesture towards the um, native population of Australia, Torres Strait Islanders, Aboriginals, um, is something that the vast majority of Australians actually want to see mm. and that that's why it was so popular uh, to begin with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, but but you're saying. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. just to again clarify. Just uh, so you know, uh, but but you, what you want to to see is ex, is a, a system, sorry, some action taken which also has practical improvement for the lives of 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 uh, yeah it, uh, as as its result. Uh, okay, well, I think. Yeah, well, that's a good, th very good. Yeah, thing, I can't, obviously. I can't disagree with that yeah. at all. And I actually, I mean, I can't, I can't even necessarily disagree with your view of the history so much. I think the, the question is, what's the, what's, what's the history used for? Yeah. I think going yeah. forward, it's a, it's a good, it's a great yeah. point that you raised. It's good. It's helpful. So, the last question. Yes, the gentleman here. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, actually, if you both are quick, we can <laughs> get both questions in right away. Okay, in the spirit of being quick, I'll try. I, I'll shorten my question a little bit. Thank you very much for giving this very insightful speech. I was very much interested in how the Australian referendum, um, and I'm very glad you held this event. My question was relating back to your uh, answer to what was democracy and elitism. Um, do you think that the elite of a country, a democratic country, when they're elected, is it the elite's job to represent and uh, and be influenced by their constituents, or do you think the elite also have a power to influence their own constituents and possibly make them cater, uh, make them not cater, uh, more similar to their own beliefs and ideas? Okay. Don't answer the question yet. We got two questions together. Uh, thank you. I think um, one thing that's very interesting about um, Australian politics is the compulsory vote, and I'm wondering the extent to which you think that actually might have shaped things because when you compare it to like Brexit or to uh, Trump, for example, those were big movements which very much influenced these aspects of people's lives that you said are like more important, like, you know, their home economy, their family, whereas this 97% of Australians would not pr in, have been directly affected by it, perhaps. So do you think there would have been a similar um, momentum to the thing if, there, if it wasn't compulsory that everyone had to vote on it? I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, yeah, Jeremy first. Yeah, well, I, the first, and it may be Burke, but I, I, I may be wrong. I'm sure you can correct me if I am, who said that I owe the, the voter my judgment, not just my kind of vote for their, their position. So I think in a healthy democracy, there needs to be an interchange from the elite. So the elite should certainly not just be reflecting just what they're hearing from their voters, but at the same time, they should listen to what they're hearing from voters, and I think in a, a well-functioning system, um, that's just what they do. I'd add quickly on the the uh, the, the compulsory democracy uh, thing. I actually think this is one of the biggest methods of oligarchic control everywhere it's practiced, because you have to look at when you have that marginal voter come out who doesn't really want to be there, who doesn't really pay attention to what's going on, who's not you know that motivated. Who really controls that vote? Does the voter or does the elite in society through the media, through Hollywood, through my favorite rugby club introduced it uh, and supported it? So I actually think that this is one of the classic examples of something that is really a kind of nasty oligarchical policy that, that um, uh, kind of masquerades as an extension of democracy. So I'll just throw that out as a political theory statement. But my ironic, I, I, my answer is ironic given given what you just said, Jeremy, because I think that, and, and I, I'd be interested to know what you actually what you think about this, but I, I think yes would have won if it was non-compulsory because it's sort of, they were, they were more, uh, they, had, they had a more activated base, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, the act, they, were act, they were more activist in their approach and they probably would have got more voters out if, it were, if that was the key to winning they probably would have found more voters to go out and actually vote on the day. Uh, whereas 
I think that the compulsory voting system actually lent towards no in this case. <laughs> so, I, know, I mean, I don't know the, the, the Australian uh, kind of voting rate is. I, I doubt that it would have flipped a 20 point election on a highly salient thing. So I think you would have had pretty high turnout with that. But I, I'm yeah, totally willing to believe that it might have been 55 45. Yeah, and something like that. I think. Yeah, I, think so, might have been, I think it might have been more like that. So, yeah. I, I yeah. <laughs> yeah, in this context, that's that's the case. I think. Theory is never perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's my take. Other, and it, I forget the first question. Did you? Yeah, yeah, that was it. That was oh, the yeah. First yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to thank everybody um, in the audience and uh, for very interesting uh, responses. I'd like, of course, to thank uh, Jeremy for a very solid set of criticisms and arguments, and I'd like to thank. Uh, um, Simon, you for a very powerful, interesting presentation, which produced uh, a genuine debate in the room on a number of topics. And, um, and I'd like to uh, um, thank you both very warmly indeed. And I look forward to future such, um, with such distinguished fellows coming and staying here, I look forward to many more eleva elevated and enlightening debates. Thank you very much. Thank you.